Well, years ago, I was uh, on the Amphi school board, and when I was on the school board, the district decided to build some new facilities in the district. So they built some new schools, and they added some buildings to some existing campuses, and every time that they would build a building, they would take and they would put one of these plaques on the front of the building. And among the things that were on those plaques were the name of the school board members. So today, you can actually go around some places in Tucson, and you can see my name is still preserved on those plaques there on those school buildings. And I won't lie to you, that's kind of cool, I think. But it's nothing compared to some other names that we're going to see this morning that were preserved for us much longer than any of those buildings were ever stand. They were preserved from us all the way back from the time that Paul wrote his letter to the church at Rome. And we're going to see this morning that that was really important. I mean, most of these people, they were just ordinary people. Had their names not been preserved by Paul here in Romans chapter 16, we'd have no idea who they were. Only a couple of them even show up anywhere else in Scripture. And I think the idea that that I want to stress this morning is that sometimes we can feel like that we're just an ordinary person and that we can't really do much for the kingdom of God. We might feel like we really don't have anything to offer. But those names that are recorded for us in, in Romans chapter 16, they prove that ordinary people can do extraordinary things for God if we allow God to work through us. So that's the idea that we're going to pursue this morning. We're going to return to the book of Romans for two last weeks. We first started this study, I was looking back, all the way back in September of 2014. And we spent some time in the book of Romans pretty much every fall with the exception of one year for, for probably a couple, two to three months. And So we're going to finally wrap up the book of Romans over these next two weeks. Now, when we get to chapter 16, Paul is no longer teaching. We no longer have this this doctrinal message that that we've seen all the way since the beginning of the book. And there's these lists of names, and frankly, this is one of those sections of Scripture that, that sometimes we might be kind of tempted to just ignore or maybe just to kind of skim over, you know, and read through there and let's get on to something with some more meat in it. But I would suggest to you that this is actually a very important part of Paul's letter because it it demonstrates to us that that all of us can make a difference in the church. All of us can make a difference for the kingdom of God. And so we're going to look at that this morning in Romans chapter 16. If you don't already have your Bibles out, go ahead and take and and turn them there to, uh, to Romans chapter 16. And I was going to ask for a volunteer to read this this morning just because I didn't want to pronounce all the names that are included in this chapter, but, but I'll go ahead and give it uh, my best shot so you can follow along knowing that I'll probably mispronounce some of these. I'm going to do what, what one of my professors told me a long time ago. He says, just act like you know how to pronounce them and just read right through it and everyone will think it's okay. So we'll try to do that. So Romans chapter 16, verse 1. I commend you to our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Senecre, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Greet Prissa and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom I not only give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Apanatus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, I can pronounce that one at least, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Greet Amplipiatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachus. Greet Apellus, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman, Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Wouldn't you love to have two daughters with that name? Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philogus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. 
Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. I'm worn out now, so that's about the end of that message for today, right? I think if I counted correctly, Paul addresses 25 different individuals in this passage, along with a couple of households and an unnamed mother and an unnamed sister here. And, and, and it's important that he addresses every single one of those people here by name. And if you go through the list, you find that those churches there in Rome, they were a di very diverse group. Just from the names themselves, as well as some of the descriptions that Paul gives here, we can see that in the church there were Jews and Gentiles. There were some rich people, there were some blue-collar workers, and there were some people who were very, very poor and who were slaves. We know that there were some who were hard workers here. And we know, most importantly of all, that there were men and women represented here. Paul actually names eight or maybe nine women by name. It kind of depends. There's some question as to whether the name Junia is a male or a female here. So there's eight or nine women that he, that he addresses by name as well as, as a, a mother and a sister as well. So, so Paul makes it clear that within this church that there were women who played important roles and carrying out the work that the church was doing there. What's really interesting to me is that had Paul not mentioned any of these people by name, we probably wouldn't even know who they are. And yet they were so important to Paul that, that he wanted to make sure that every one of their names was written down there so it would be preserved. And so here we are today, almost 2,000 years after Paul writes this letter, and we know who these people are. But they were just ordinary people who did some extraordinary things. And that's really the point that I want us to take away from, from the message today. Here's the, the main idea that I would like to take us away today. That the church consists of ordinary people doing extraordinary work in Christ. That's who we are. We're just, we're just ordinary people who God has called to do extraordinary work. In Christ. And this morning I want us to, to understand how we here at Thornydale Family Church, how we can allow God to use us to do some extraordinary things. And so this morning I want to share with you four things that, that we want to take from this passage, four things we can learn about how we can allow God to use us to do some extraordinary things for His kingdom. So here's the first thing that I want us to see this morning, the first thing we need to do, and that is that we need to welcome and we need to receive others like Jesus welcomes us. We need to welcome and receive others like Jesus welcomes us. There's a sense in which the way that we welcome and greet each other will be a good indication of what we believe about Jesus Christ and about how He welcomes us. You'll notice here that, that he uses the command greet, I think 10 times if I count it correctly in this passage, ending in verse 16 with the command to greet one another with a holy kiss. Now I know earlier that when I read that, some of you guys got a little uncomfortable because you might have thought, that, well, that's where we're going today and Pat's, one of his points is going to be that we're going to greet each other with a holy kiss and that might not be real comfortable to some of you. Let me just make you a little more uncomfortable. That same command is repeated three other places, word for word in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and 1 Thessalonians. And Peter has a similar command. He says that we're to, to greet each other with a kiss of love. So I'm going to let you just stew on that a little bit for a moment while we talk about this whole idea of what it means to greet one another in Christ. And then we'll kind of come back to that and, and see how we might be able to apply that in today's culture. So the word greet there, it's a word that means to, to kind of embrace or to take someone into your arms. Um, and it came to mean to, to welcome someone or to, to greet them. And it was an important word here. And it must have been important because Paul uses it 10 different times here to describe how we're to interact with each other within the body of Christ. And the idea here is that we're to welcome and to receive others like Jesus welcomes us. How does he do that? He welcomes us with unconditional love, doesn't he? 
He welcomes us in spite of, of the times that we might fail Him. He welcomes us regardless of, of who we are, whether we're Jew or Gentile, male or female, whether we're rich or poor. And within the body of Christ, we need to be able to do that with each other. We need to genuinely welcome each other and to greet each other within, within the body of Christ. You know, sometimes today we tend to uh, try to substitute technology for face-to-face -face interactions, don't we? And I'm grateful for technology. I mean, just this week, I wish somebody halfway across the world who I've never met face-to-face, -face, I wish that person happy birthday. And I'm glad that I can do that, and there's nothing wrong with that. But technology will never be a substitute for the face-to-face the -face interaction that we have with each other within the body of Christ. We, you guys know, we stream our services each week. And we do that because for a, lot, a variety of reasons, there are people who can't be with us. Sometimes they're sick, sometimes they're out of town. We can also minister to people who aren't even here in the United States and some, sometimes. But we were a little leery of doing that at first because we were afraid that possibly some people would take and make that a substitute for coming here and being together. Now, Fortunately, that hasn't happened. I can really say that, that from what I understand, what I know, that people are using that only when they really can't be here. And that's great. It's good that we have those tools. But there's nothing that will substitute for this interaction that we have with each other. Okay, so knowing that, how about this holy kiss thing? Well, back in that culture and, and in some places around the world today, it was customary to greet each other with a, with a kiss on the cheek. And so people would do that. It was a, it was a physical action that represented your, your love for someone else, your respect and your honor for them. And so they would do that. And so, so Paul says to do that here. But he says it's to be a holy kiss. And the idea of a holy kiss was that it wasn't in any way to, to, to be contrary to who we are in Jesus Christ. That we're not to, we're not to just go around kissing a bunch of people for for all the wrong reasons, but it needs to be a holy kiss. And part of that holy kiss is because we are set apart. We are holy. We're called holy ones in the Scripture because we're set apart. And so it was done out of, out of respect and honor and love for the other person. Now today in our culture, for some very good reasons, because of some of the kind of accusations that go around, because of lawsuits that we face, we have to be really careful sometimes, don't we, with how we how we physically approach each other and touch each other. And that's, that's kind of unfortunate. And so, how do we take this idea of a holy kiss and really apply it to, uh, to our culture today? I, I think there's some things we can learn from that. And one of the things that I think we can learn, and maybe the most important thing to take away, is that you don't go around generally kissing someone who you have a conflict with, right? Right? I know for Mary and I, if we get to a conflict, I'm probably, that's not the time I'm going to come around and, and give her a kiss, right, until we restore that relationship. And so the idea here is that within the body of Christ, when there is a conflict, when we have something with someone else, we need to go ahead and reconcile that and resolve that and restore that relationship so that we can genuinely come and to welcome each other, whatever form that might take. And so I don't think we... we we have to do a holy kiss, but, but we do have to have those reconciled relationships. So the first thing is if we want God to be able to use us as ordinary people, we have to begin to welcome and receive others like Jesus welcomes us. The second thing that we have to do is this. We have to determine my role. It's really interesting to me how many different roles that people had within the church here that, that Paul writes about. He starts out and he talks about Phoebe. And Phoebe is probably the one who actually took the letter that Paul wrote while he's in Corinth and delivered it to the churches there in Rome. So that, that in itself was a very important role that she had. But it also says here that she was a patron. So she was probably a wealthy woman who was giving of her financial resources to support Paul's ministry and the ministry of the early church. So that's one of the things that happened here. We see Prissa and Aquila, it says here that they, they basically saved Paul's life, at least on one occasion. It says also that they held a church right there in their house. And so they, 
they were extending hospitality to other people there. We see that, that Rufus's mother was like a mother to Paul. We don't know exactly what that is, and we don't know a whole lot about it, but somehow she administered to Paul just like, like a mother that he didn't have. And then we see all these other people. It talks about how they were going to come back to this in a moment. They worked hard, and they were laborers in the Lord, and we don't know exactly what they did, but you can see all these different roles that were present there in the church in Rome. And what's really interesting to me is that Paul doesn't, prioritize those or give more value to one than the other. They're all equally valuable in the eyes of Paul and in the eyes of God. And the same thing is true right here at Thornydale Family Church. And we've talked about this before. We all have different roles within the body of Christ. And some of those roles, like what I do on, on Sunday morning or the worship team, some of those things are more public and you might see them. But there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes. You don't necessarily see the people in the, in the sound booth back there. The only time you notice them is if they make a mistake, and then everyone turns around and looks at them, which isn't really fair, is it? Because they do such a great job 99.9% .9 of the time that you don't even know they're there. We have people who clean up after refreshments, <coughs> excuse me, on Sunday morning. You probably never even know that they do that. And here's the thing, all of those roles are equally valuable within the body of Christ. We talked about this all the way back in Romans chapter 12, how God has gifted each one of us uniquely to serve the body. And so each one of us need to fulfill that role, whatever it might be. And I know that a lot of you here are already doing that, and that's great. And we want to thank you for doing that. I'm going to talk in, a little, in just a couple minutes about some of you who maybe are looking for a place of service and, and how you can find that place of service within the body of Christ. But we have to determine our role. The third thing that we have to do is to work hard. Notice here what it says. He, look at how many times he talks about his fellow workers or how many times he writes about those who worked hard in the Lord here. Ministry can be hard work, right? It's not always easy. I think most of us have found that out over time, that, that, that it can be a great joy, but at the same time, it can be, it can be really hard. And that's what, what we see here. There are some of these people who are working really hard within the churches there at Rome. Now, obviously, there's a balance here. We are to work hard. The Bible talks about it, particularly in the book of Proverbs. Ryan's getting into the book of Proverbs now in his writings, and and, and, and we're seeing there that there is a value in hard work, that the Bible values hard work. But at the same time, we have to balance that against the other extreme, which is trying to do everything in my strength and in my power, and like the whole world just depends on me, and if I don't get it done, it's just not going to get done kind of thing. And I know, I know that's my tendency. I know some of you here that you know, that's your thing is you have a hard time delegating work because you figure, man, if I don't do it, it isn't going to get done or it won't get done as well as I do it. And, and we need to balance against that, obviously. But there is value in hard work. We see that, valiant, that balance when we get to, to the fourth and final point that we're going to look at this morning, and that is we work hard, but then we also have to depend on God for the results. And that's really what this is all about here, where it talks about the idea that, um, if you can go ahead and go to the next slide there, Abigail, that would be great. Okay, trust the results to Jesus. I couldn't remember exactly how I put it. But that's what we have to do, right? And that's the idea here. That's why in this passage, he writes time after time, he writes, in Christ, in Christ, in Jesus, in Christ, in the Lord. Is because Paul understood that we're not capable of doing the extraordinary work that God wants us to do in our strength and in our power. We have to rely upon God for the results. Yes, we want to work hard, but God never holds us responsible for the results. He just holds us responsible for doing that which He has called us to do and then trusting the results to Him. Probably one of the best places we see this is in the book of 1 Corinthians. And Paul writes... There in the first in, in, in First Corinthians about how we need to, to trust the results to God. If you can go ahead and go to the next slide there. He writes this. So what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. 
And that's the idea that we have here is that 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 was hard work to plant. It was hard work to water. But what they had to do is they had to re- re- rely upon God to give the growth. Only God could give the growth. And that's why we, what we have to do here. And when we do that, there's a couple of great things that happen. When we learn to, to trust the results to God, the first thing is, is that we can accomplish a whole lot more when we don't care who gets the credit. I love what Ronald Reagan said about this. He said, there is no limit to the amount of good you can do if you don't care who gets the credit. And so if we would just trust the results to God, if we didn't care whether we're getting the credit, then then we can accomplish a whole lot more than we could otherwise. I think the second thing is that a lot of times we're held back in our ministry because of our fear of failure or fear of being rejected. And if we would trust the results to God, we would realize that we're not responsible for the results. We're only responsible of doing what God has called us to do. That's especially true when it comes to sharing our faith. God just calls us to be witnesses for Jesus. We're not responsible for the other person and whether they reject Jesus or not. We're only responsible to do what God has called us to do and then trust Him for the results. I'm still learning a lot about this balance between hard work and trusting the results to to God. I'm getting a little better at it. I think especially in my sermon preparation, I've learned how important this is. I mean, preparing a sermon is hard work. Digging into the text and and mulling over it and meditating on it and, and trying to come up with a way to present that to you in a way that would be helpful to you, that's hard work. But I've also learned that that that's only part of the process. The other part of the process that's just as important is praying to God and asking God to to give me a a picture of what He wants me to say to you guys. Asking Him to lead me to, to share words with you that would be appropriate and relevant for us as a body. And if I ignore either part of that process, then my messages will not be what God wants them to be. So there has to be that balance there. And your ministry, I know, is going to be different, but I think the same thing is true there. Whatever it might be, it's important to work hard, but it's also important that we trust the results to God. So we've seen this morning that the church consists of ordinary people who do extraordinary things in Christ. So as we close our time this morning, what I want to do is to make this this really practical for us this morning. How do, we, how do we make sure that we do that? How do we, how do we take and apply these principles that we've looked at this morning? And most of you are probably, if you've been here for any time, are probably familiar with our discipleship path. At a minimum, hopefully you've looked at it as you walk out the building every week. And the elders developed this discipleship path several years ago as a, a tool to help us to be able to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And you'll notice that the, <coughs> excuse me, the path is in the shape of a circle. And we did that intentionally for a couple of reasons. Number one, to remind us that we never finish the path. It's not like going to school, you know, and you get out of high school and you graduate and you're done. We're continually on this path. We're continually to be growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ. It also reminds us that sometimes these steps overlap, don't they? You can do several of them at the same time. You can grow and you can serve and you can share your faith and you might be doing all three things at the same time sometimes. So there's some overlap. And finally, and I think this is really important, it's to remind us that one of our our duties, one of our responsibilities is to reproduce this same life in the life of others who are not yet disciples of Jesus. See, when we go to to the share step, what do we do? We bring someone in and we tell them to come and to experience Jesus and hopefully get them on that same path. And and, and from time to time, we remind you as a body, we probably, I probably haven't done as good of a job of that as I'd like to. So one of my goals over this year is to make sure that I bring this to your attention occasionally to remind you of the steps that God might want you to take this year in order to grow in your relationship with Him. 
Now, you're not going to be surprised that I want to spend just a few moments this morning focusing on the serve part of that discipleship path, because that's what we're talking about here, right? How we can serve God in the body of Christ. And I know there are many of you here this morning, like I said earlier, who are already serving. Thank you so much for that. But let me address a couple other groups of people who are here this morning. First of all, there might be some of you who are serving here this morning, but over time, God, God has, has shown you that maybe that's not the best use of your gifts, that maybe you ought to be serving somewhere else. We've talked about this before, that the importance of discovering our gifts, and the, and the best way we do that is by starting to serve. Once we get moving, God can guide us, and He can show us where He wants us to be. And maybe you've come to the place where you think, you know, maybe my gifts would be better utilized somewhere else. And then there are some of you who aren't serving anywhere at all right now. And you think, maybe you're thinking, well, I don't really have anything to offer. But what this passage shows us this morning is that's just not true. Every single purpose or person in here this morning has been gifted by God to use your gifts within this body for the glory of God and to build up the body. And so if you're not serving right now, I want to encourage you to consider how God might want you to serve. So if you're in those last two groups, the ones that might be looking for a different place to serve, if you're not already serving, I want to encourage you to do three things. Number one, to pray. Ask God, God, where do you want to use me? And I think that's a prayer God will answer. If you, if you pray that genuinely, God wants you to, to know that. He's not trying to hide that from you. And then secondly, go ahead and talk to one of our elders. You can talk to me or any of the other ones. You'll, the contact information is on the back of the bulletin, so, so you can find that there. Let us know, hey, I'm prayed about this, and I think this is where God is leading me to serve. Or maybe it's just, hey, I'm not really sure where to serve right now, but, but do you have some place you can get me plugged in? And then finally, would you go ahead and begin serving? Like we say, that's always the best way for us to to understand where God wants us to use us. The church consists of people, ordinary people, doing extraordinary work in Christ. The people whose names appear there in Romans chapter 16, I don't think they ever expected that their names would be preserved in the pages of Scripture. They just serve God. And the same is true for us. We we know now that our names definitely aren't going to get preserved in the pages of Scripture, right? But you know what? God knows what we're doing. God knows our names. God knows how we've been serving Him. God knows how we've been taking this, this ordinary life that we've been given and doing extraordinary things in Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I want to encourage you, would you allow Jesus to do extraordinary things through your ordinary